we're not, we are separate companies. So between the SEC wanting more and more data to give you guys information, which none of you read, like prospectuses and things like that, and between brokerage firms that now have very high minimums of who they want to do business with, it's, it's just what I was saying earlier for some of you that weren't maybe online and hearing me is organizations like OSHER and the SMU CAPE program and TCU, the lifelong learning, it is essential because what ends up happening is that investors turn to people they see on TV or on the radio and like Susie Orman. You may think, well, Susie said sell everything, but Susie is worth 30, $40 million. She doesn't need any risk, right? So her giving advice to people that aren't in that situation is really improper because those people can't afford to be very, very conservative because you will outlive your money. And the reason that I decided to actually push this topic as a class, which this age bracket is perfect for this subject, is because when I first got into the business, you would have men that basically retired at 55 or 60, and there wasn't a lot of them making it past 70. So what you would do as an investment portfolio manager is that you would take their age, you would subtract it by 100. So if they're 70, that would be 30. Then that means 30% of their portfolio is going to be in growth. The rest of it is going to be in fixed income. Well, nowadays, what's the problem with that? People live longer. You're going to outlive your money. So what is happening right now in 401k plans is that people are going back and suing their employers saying, I've been putting money into my 401k for years. You never did anything to help educate me on what I'm doing as far as my investments. And now I outlive my money. So it must be your fault. So in the last couple of years, we've seen all of these changes. And as individual investors, you guys are part of the problem. So in 2008, people looked at the real estate market and said, we don't have a good real estate mutual fund in our 401k. So they filed suit. So what did companies do? They scrambled to put in a mutual fund that was focused on, on real estate about the time real estate collapsed. Same thing what just happened and is happening now with Bitcoin. So all of a sudden you're realizing, hey, the flavor of the day is Bitcoin. So now companies are being sued because they don't have a Bitcoin offering. And then if they did six months ago, it's now gone from 60 down to 20 and the lawsuits will come in that now you provided an investment option. You didn't tell me, you didn't ask me if I would know what I was doing. And once again, they have liability. So this whole industry now is ultimately people pulling back, which is why compliance has gone up so high. The only major investment company that you see commercials of is Fisher Investments. And most of most people that watch the commercials, they don't even want to do business with you because mm -hmm. you don't have enough money. So that's what I mean by it. people have figured out they don't want to do it on their own. They don't know where to turn anymore. And I, you got people like me saying, there's no book you can go buy to figure this out. There's no Susie Orman, Jim Cramer, or anybody else because they don't know you. And the whole idea is, is to step back, go back to the retirement planning, financial planning, and say, why am I even invested in the market? In 2007, money markets were paying 5.5% to take no risk, 5.5%. So as a portfolio manager, if you're dealing with clients that only need 5%, there's no reason to be in the market, right? Why take risk if the client is getting the return that they need? But the clients, at the time I did that, the clients started emailing in going, because the market kept going up, 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 and up, going, I'm missing out. I think you're being too conservative. So it's this constant battle between what regulators want for you guys as individual investors, what you guys want as individual investors, and the people that are trying to advise you. And it's very, very difficult that all of those come together. Because right now, if I had 25% of your portfolio in the market, it could be down 20%. And that's going to overshadow the 75% of your account that's not been in the market all year. It might not have made much money, but it's not down money. Either way, you're not happy. And the funny thing is, is why I go back as a portfolio manager for, you know, like I said, I've been in the business since 96, is I've seen this. And that's where I look at people like Warren Buffett and I say, there's things that he says, which is correct, but managing a pile of money is far, far different than managing accounts for Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And that is a huge difference between why, although I agree with most of 
I should say most, a lot of what he does makes a lot of sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense on the time, but in hindsight, it made sense. Like in the dot com, he was so conservative, people laughed at him and told him that he had lost it. And all of a sudden, a couple of years later, it was so glad that he wasn't focused on the market. So that's why I'm trying to get people to understand, you know, how many times I've been asked, what book do you, what do you think about Jim Cramer? What do you think about Susie Orm? I look at it going, who cares what all those people say? Those people don't know you. And as a matter of fact, in the industry, we have a rule called rule 405. Know your client. You have to provide suitable advice for that client. How is sitting on TV telling people what to buy or sell and they know nothing about the people that, that are listening to them, how is that suitable? Which is where the disclaimers come in, mad money. It's not for your life savings. So many of you are looking back when, well, then who is for my life savings? And that's where ultimately you look and say, all right, well, a, a strategy like selling covered calls, you've never heard of, about it, most of you. Has anybody in here heard about it? Previously, you'd heard about it? I don't know anything about it. Okay. Well, the, the reason that it's, it's generally not something that people understand is because years ago when there was commission stock trading, the commissions that would be charged would outweigh the strategy of trying to make money off of the stocks that you already have, right? If I'm gonna sell a call and make 150 bucks and the commission is 95, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, okay? But nowadays when you have no trading cost or very little trading costs, you have fee-based accounts, which are essentially an annual agreement that you have with an advisor. It's divided up generally per quarter is the fee you pay. So the more your, your account goes up, the more you pay. If it drops, the less you pay. So it's the best relationship you can have with an advisor if that's what you're looking for, because you're on the same side of the table. No advisor wants to earn less, right? So generally they're not gonna provide you advice thinking your account goes down. But the reality is, is that that's what happens because the biggest problem that I tell investors is that you hire financial advisors that are not portfolio managers. So you think that your advisor who's pushed you into a bunch of mutual funds is actually your manager. The reality is they're not your manager. The manager is the mutual fund managers that are running those mutual funds, okay? And there are guidelines within mutual funds that managers have to follow, okay? So for example, if you put your money into a small cap mutual fund and the small cap stocks are running extremely out of favor, as a manager, I don't have the ability within the mutual fund to sell and put a bunch of, my, of money in cash. Usually in those mutual funds, only about 5% is allowed to be sitting in cash. So if you are in a small cap mutual fund that is going to start hitting major resistance, it's you that has to know it's about to hit major resistance. You have to be the one that goes in if it's in your 401k and sell. The manager can't do it for you. Your advisor usually is out trying to bring in more money for the firm. They aren't there to try to proactively get you out of the, the mutual fund. Then you turn on the TV and you have these, these money managers that are compensated to basically say everybody, buy and hold. You're a long-term investor. Everything will work out over time. Well, you guys at your age demographic is that might've worked 25, 30 years ago. And there's no doubt the charts support the fact that had you just hung on everything was gonna turn out. Well, the part about Warren Buffett that I really agree with is in hindsight, as he says, you could just put your money into the S&P 500 index fund and hands off. If you did that, then all you really still need to be responsible for is knowing what's coming. So even though I'm in this great diversified fund, I still need to know potentially should I even be in it? So like November of last year, as you saw all of this economic data starting to form, that says there might not be a lot of positive gains. You could say I'm out of the S&P 500. 
which at the time last year, it was up 27%. So for most of you that only need a four, five, 6% return to get into and through retirement, 27 puts you three, four years ahead of the game, right? So now this year, you've almost given all of that back. And what's the difference is eventually the buy and hold your long-term strategy that you hear on TV, it's a joke. And the reason it's a joke is because these people don't know what else to say. They're compensated for you to stay in the market, not for you to get out of the market. And it's true with mutual fund managers. It's true with Goldman Sachs that has their equity analyst that's out there paying, that's paid five or $6 million a year to promote what Goldman Sachs wants them to promote because of the holdings that Goldman Sachs has behind the scenes, okay? So that's why I say is that you need to individualize the investing. Because if you were to do a financial plan or a retirement plan or use a financial calculator and you say, I need a 6% return to get into a retirement, I need a 4%. Ideally, you'd be down around two or three or zero, right? Like why go to the market if you don't have to? But most of you, that is not the case. You need the market, you need your money to generate some type of growth or income for you to be able to get into and through retirement. And really where we're starting to see that very important is, and I remember this like it was yesterday. In 1996, before I, I moved to Texas and started working at Merrill Lynch, I was working at a small stockbroking firm because I went to college in University of Minnesota. So I said, well, if I want to get into this business, I want to go work day in and day out and see what it's like. So I was a cold caller for a stockbroker, which you don't hear stockbroker term much anymore, but back then you did. And I remember one time we went to lunch and in the elevator before we went back to work, he hands me, a, and this was 96, he hands me a magazine and says, I'd like you to read up on these things called mutual funds because they're starting to gain a lot of growth. That's 96, and people think mutual funds have been around forever, which they've been around for a long time, but the popularity <laughs> and around that popularity came 401ks. So now what's ended up happening is, is that many people that retire, the vast majority of their wealth is in tax deferred accounts, which is great because it means that when you buy and sell stock, you don't pay capital gains. If you buy stock that has a dividend, you don't pay income tax. If you sell covered calls, this strategy is ideal inside a tax deferred account because it's income and you don't have to pay tax till you take the money out. The issue is, which is why this strategy is becoming to me so important is, is that now most of you have so much money in your 401ks that let's just say you have a million dollars and you say, well, when I'm, when I'm retired based on a 10% return, that's going to be enough for me to be able to live comfortably. Well, first of all, you can't count on 10% return. And secondly, you got to figure out that whatever gain you have, you have to pull the money out and pay tax on it. So that means if you have a million dollars and you really do need a hundred thousand dollars to live, that means that you need to make about $125,000 a year in income without touching your principal. Well, you can't count on that, right? So that's why we start to try to get people, which has been an utter failure since 1998, when fee-based accounts were introduced, was at that time, is that if you, did, if you opened up a fee-based account, you got a free financial plan. For whatever reason, people don't like financial plans. And the reason is, is like men going to the doctor. I don't really want to know until literally my arm is about to fall off. Then I'll deal with it because the pain is not that big of a deal. That's how finances work because it's real. Those plans need everything, all the information. And you know, in the back of your mind, you probably are off to a late start. You're not quite where you want to be. And so therefore it's just easier not to do it. And I tried to really get people to even if you don't even share it with your spouse, go somewhere and figure out what that number is. Do I need a 4% return with my money, a 6%, 8%, whatever it is. But the reality is that's where it all starts. So the whole point about this class of selling covered calls is to say, look, if you need a 6 or 7% return, then we need to take to look at your money. We need every single possible ability strategy that there is out there to try to get you that annual return. Because it's not just a, financial and retirement plans don't just say, well, you just need 10% for a couple of years. They run those numbers until you're 85. For women, if you live until you're 95, the plan is by default 10 years off. 
So it makes it more and more important to be able to look at your money in every single different strategy you need to be able to access. That doesn't mean you always implement it because different markets will require different strategies. But the bottom line is, is that over the last several years, if you need a three or 4% return, where did you get it? You didn't get it in money markets. You didn't get it in CDs. You didn't get it in treasuries. So you might've looked to the bond market. Well, the bond market has fallen like the stock market. So you didn't get it there. So at the end of the day, now you're starting to see, especially with seniors, what the complaint has been. Where I end up having to invest in equities because there's nowhere else to go and I need this return. So that's why ideally for people that say I need 80,000 at retirement, we try to obviously get that down as low as possible. We'd like to be able to be around a three or 4% return for you to be able to get through retirement. Even if you have to eat a little bit of the principal, that's not that big of a deal, right? I mean, you, you did save the money. You worked you hard, you saved the money. And if you leave the kids some great, if you don't, the most important thing is you fund yourself, right? So at the end of the day, that's where you look at it saying, if I only need a 4% return, guess what? In the, in the next few months, you're gonna be able to literally keep your money into a brokerage money market account and you will take zero risk and almost get that 4%. So moving forward, your risk threshold is gonna be a lot different than what you've been dealing with the last few years when the federal funds rate was zero. And if you, if you didn't get the returns from bonds, that's what I mean. You're forced to go into equities. And that's where we're going to look and say, all right, well, moving forward, if the federal funds rate is 4% and you only need a 4%, well, then this selling covered cost strategy is really not even that critical for you to use right this second, right? Because if the money markets get to 4% and that's all you need, this strategy doesn't mean anything for now. However, in 2023, they're already starting to talk about how the Federal Reserve may go right back into cutting rates. So what, in two years, now this type of strategy could come right back into play. So that's why it's important to, to educate you guys on what's out there, whether you implement this strategy or not, is up to you. And it's up to your advisor and it's up to your situation. But here is a tool that you can use, especially in tax deferred accounts, that I consider it's like earning free money. And what I love about it is I also look out throughout my career and say, where did people run out of money the fastest? Was it because the market went up or down and they ran out of money? And that answer is no. The only time that happened to hurt a lot of people was in the dot-com collapse, where you had three years in a row of negative equity returns. At the same time, you're pulling money out if you were retired at that time, which means your million dollars ended up at 300,000 and you kept pulling money out. So you didn't have the full 300,000 to recover when the market recovered. And that's what bothers me about buy and hold and long-term investing, because at a certain age or a certain situation of your life, you are no longer a quote, long-term investor by definition. You might still live 20 years, but your money now is at a point where it's got to work for you. And that's why OSHER and Lifelong Learning, this is the perfect time for you guys to be introduced to it. And for some of you that are, are still younger than, especially 60 years old, but maybe even 65, what I also love about it is a lot of people, when I go back and say, where did these people run into issues with their accounts? It had to do with health. It had to do with people like my mother that got dementia early. She didn't listen to me, of course. I've been in the business 26 years. Mom wouldn't buy long-term care. And the reality is what happened is she figured, well, what a lot of people do, Medicare will cover it. And in her entire dementia, her almost a little more than three and a half years from start to passing away, uh, the only time Medicare stepped in and paid anything was six months. Once they've determined that you're probably gonna live less than six months, then they will kick in the money. Otherwise, it was all out of pocket. And in her case, she had my father to take care of her. But especially nowadays, as divorces are high and more and more people are living by themselves, one of the things that this strategy does is it takes a four or $500,000 portfolio and very, very easily can generate enough premium to pay for long-term care. 
So that way, if you say I only need $40,000 to get through retirement and you're not including long-term care, then you don't need 45,000. You probably need 80,000 because the true cost of long-term care, which means you cannot do two of six daily functions. And I don't care if you're 20, I've had it since I've been 30 because nowadays it's not, it's not senior citizen, right? It is long-term care. I can't do two of six daily functions and it doesn't matter what age. And I can tap into that because what we're finding out is the true cost, not what they advertise. The true cost to not be able to do two or six daily functions in a facility is around eight or 9,000 a month. So if you want to run out of money really fast, then don't get the coverage. But if you look at it as a business and say, okay, at 50 years old, I'm going to get long-term care and it costs me a thousand dollars a year. Now it might be more, but I'm just for easy numbers. So let's just say I don't need that coverage and it's $75,000 a year is what I'm, I'm buying coverage of. The amounts can differ, so the premium differs. But let's just say 75,000. Then that means that for 20 years, 20 years I wasted $1,000 a year or I wasted $20,000 getting this policy that says if I can't do two to six day functions, I'm going to be able to tap into it and receive $75,000 worth of care. When I do put in that first claim and my coverage starts, what's my payback for the $20,000 that I put in over 20 years? About four months, four months at 8,000 a month. So you wasted 20 years of quote money and your return for that money was four months needing that coverage. So, in the investment business, we talk about the importance of IRAs and Roth IRAs and put in 6,000, now put in 7,000. The reality is, is for 20 years, you could put in $7,000 a year at a 10% return and you get to a point that you can't do two or six daily functions and you'll be out of money in two or three years of coverage. When that whole time, you could have just put in 6,000 instead of 7,000 and made sure you bought this coverage, okay? And I'm not in the insurance business. I used to be, but I got out of it because I didn't want people thinking that I was selling this concept to make money. I received nothing. All I'm telling you is for 26 years, this is how you're <laughs> gonna run out of money, okay? So it's another advantage of this type of, of program because it takes the assets you already have and it generates income to cover this, which makes you sleep better at night knowing, hey, if something happens to me, I know my life doesn't flip upside down. And there should be a lot of power uh, in, in knowing that that is going to happen. Okay. So we talked about why you haven't, most of you hadn't heard about this and it's because number one, the commissions were too high. <laughs> Advisors generally are not portfolio managers. They're more or less pushing you into the mutual funds. And this strategy does not work on mutual funds. This strategy works on individual stocks, the vast majority of them. And it also uh, works on what's called exchange traded funds, which are like Sometimes they're like mutual funds, but they trade like stocks. So they fall under some stock um, protections in, in the covered call and protective put options, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna look at it and say, all right, for some of you that if you don't own any individual stocks right now, that's fine. You just, again, sit back, you're just gonna learn something for the next hour and you might never even use this. However, for some of you, you could look at this, say, this changes my life because now that I know this, I'm gonna find some, either I'm gonna implement it myself or I'm gonna find someone to do this, but by God, this is what I'm gonna do moving forward, okay? So that's what we wanna go over. Now it's very, very important for all of you, and there's only one test question at the end of this session, and that is, are we talking about covered calls or uncovered calls? That's what I'm gonna ask you. We are not talking about uncovered calls. So for the recordings, the video, make sure. Uncovered options are one of the fastest ways you will run out of money. Ask the people that traded on Robinhood. Now the lawsuits are coming in because they traded uncovered options. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about covered options. And the word covered means you already own the underlying stock. So you already own Microsoft, you own Texas Instruments, you own Oxy Petroleum, okay? And not only do you own it, and this is where you're gonna to wanna to write down because it's not in my slide. You have to have 100 shares of the underlying stock in order to sell a covered call. 
So 100 shares of the stock equals one call option. So these printouts that I've given you come from Yahoo Finance, which I use every day. I also have a Fidelity system that I can access, but I, for whatever reason, I find Yahoo Finance the easy. You can create your own portfolios. This information is very, very easy to access, which is why I like to share it with individual investors because it's a very easy place for you to start. You can learn how the, the website is gonna work for you. And it's not gonna take you a lot of time to be able to look at key uh, information about what would be useful in this situation, okay? So the covered call option is basically, again, I own the stock and I'm gonna sell. So when I sell something, I receive money. So when I sell a covered call, I receive money. So even though the call may not expire for a month, I get the money now, okay? So that's one of the advantages. So if I buy a stock and I do nothing, right? It can go up, it can go down, who knows where it goes. And if I sell a covered call, it's the same thing. Once I sell the call, so if I own the stock, let's just say it's at 60 and I sell you guys the right to take it away from me at 65 in one month. So the, the options expire sometimes weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, annually. You can, there's a wide range of how long, long, it's like term insurance. You can figure out how long you want this, to, this option to expire. So depending on a client situation is that I tend, have a tendency to focus on the options that expire weekly. And then on certain stocks like Verizon and a couple of examples we're gonna see in here that are very, very boring if it's boring, meaning it doesn't go up and down a lot, it's not going to pay a lot of premium. And you're going to see an example today where I just printed this stuff out on Friday. And Microsoft was trading at $262 and change at 1140 our time. The market closes at three. I had the ability to sell the right to lose Microsoft at 265 in three, a little over three hours for 27 cents per share premium. So in my language, I call that free money. The clients aren't doing it. I'm doing it for them. Yeah. So there's hourly? You said hourly? No, it's it weekly. So it's oh, so okay. some so stocks every, and, and so like when you okay. when you go to Yahoo Finance and you click on the options and this is where I put stars. Okay, so this one here that's just that's where when I printed this off. So we'll just perfect time to go over the first example. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to pick out a stock that you like, right? And you still got to do your research. You got to figure out, is this a good time to buy this thing or not, right? I mean, two, about uh, three and a half months ago, Verizon was $52 a share, okay? So if you entered into a bunch of covered calls when Verizon, a boring, good dividend paying stock was at 52, it's now 41. So you're still down over 20% on a great company, right? So you still got to know, you still got to factor all this stuff in, okay? So at the end of the day, I just want to pick a stock, okay? And then next, I we put these little circles in. So then we're going to look at the earnings date. So I look at the earnings date because if an if an earnings come in a, a particular week, it's going to affect whether or not I want to sell a call on that. Because usually I want to lose the stock. If I'm going to lose it, I want to lose it before they announce their earnings, okay? And this is something that if any of you trade, you probably already noticed yourself. 85% of the time when a stock announces their earnings, the stock goes down, okay? So when you're in an IRA account, if you're somewhat of an active trader, you can just look at it and say, look, if the stock has run up, there's a very high chance. It means it's buy on the rumor, sell on the news. So you have to factor that in as a trader and you certainly have to factor that in on the options as well. Sometimes I wanna lose it. If I have IRA account, I'm very aggressive selling calls because I don't care if I lose it. There's no taxes. And there's no cost to the, for me to buy the stock back for the client. So, so there's no reason to just leave this money on the table is what I'm saying. If you're in a taxable account, that's different because now if we lose it, we've got capital gains, capital losses. We get, it's just a different strategy, right? But first thing we do is we're gonna pick out the stock. So I can look at it and say, I like this stock. Well, whether or not it's right for you, who knows? But then I look at the earnings date. Okay, say it's November 2nd, so that's a ways off. Then I wanna look at it and say, what's the forward dividend yield? So if I bought this stock and did nothing and just hung on to it, I'm gonna get a little less than 1% at this price, right? So at the end of the day, I could be fine with that. I could look at it like many of you who own stocks now, 
that don't that, that don't use the sever, selling covered call strategy, this is what you're going to do. You're going to buy it because Warren Buffett bought it, and you're going to sit on it, and that's fine. You're probably going to get nice upside, and then you're going to get one percent. So I can look at it and say, okay, this is perfect. So I'm not going to if I need five percent a year to pay my bills, this isn't going to get me there. A Verizon could because it's over six percent, but Verizon, like Senate, could go down twenty percent. So the bottom line is, is I look at it going, okay. So this is a little less than 1%. I like the company. So let's just see if this covered call is going to be a good strategy for this stock. So now we're going to scroll down to page two. So now you see, you see Oxy Petroleum, and then you see where I put this circle that says September 16th. So mind you, I printed this stuff off last week. So the option had already expired on Friday. So at the close of the day on the 16th, the option, if we were in it, is now over. So if we didn't lose the stock, then we just start all over next week. Okay. So in this particular case, this is where Yahoo Finance, when you click on options, it's going to bring up all these different prices. So obviously the stock is at 64, and the first thing, the first number that they start dealing with is 30. So that's not going to do us any good. So then we're going to keep scrolling to the next page. Okay. So now they start out at 50 and it goes all the way to 65. So at the very bottom of the page, you'll see where I put a circle. So at the time I could have on Friday, I could have sold the right to lose Oxy Petroleum at $65 at the close of business on Friday. And in return, they were going to pay me six to seven. So in this case, you see six and you see seven. One is the bid, one's the ask. So we're going to take the lower amount is what is what's potential in our pocket. So for six cents in a stock trading at 63.74, it's really not enough to waste the time to do it unless you have a you know 5,000, 10,000 shares. Yeah. Then it's that money starts to add up. But if you just have 100 shares, you're not going to mess around with six cents, right? Because what happened two weeks ago is all of a sudden about about an, uh, an hour before the close of the market, the news comes out that the Department of Energy approved Buffett to buy 50% of this company. So if you sold a call and didn't ask it to go very high, you would have lost it because it went up a lot at the end of that trading session. So that's why you always have to factor this in. So that's not enough for me to mess up. So, but we still wanna just keep going and see what our options are. So on the next page, if you scroll down, is that you're gonna see where I circled September 23rd. So obviously now that's the end of Friday of this week. So this is obviously a stock that offers these covered call options on a weekly basis, which is what I like, because most of the stocks I own, I don't really wanna lose them, right? If I didn't like them, I'd sell them. I just want free money. That's what this comes down to. I just want free money because that free money helps pay my fees, and it also helps the client be able to meet the expenses or the annual return that they need. So not, there's no harm in this, okay? So here we look at it and go, all right, so if we go out a week, again, go back to this is last Friday and we're having to make this decision. So last Friday, we're not gonna mess with the one that, that the option that closed on Friday. So now we're gonna look at and say, all right, well, let's look a week ahead. So now the stock, is the, the, the bottom of the option is 56. So we got to go to another page because that's not going to do it for us. Okay, so then on the next page, we're going to see at the, at the end of the market on Friday, when Oxy Petroleum is 63.74, is that now we can decide, should we sell the right to lose this stock at 67? Because if I don't really want to lose it, I'm asking it to go up almost 5% in one week. Now, if you need 5% a year, and this is what I'm telling you about this strategy. If you're telling me that you need 4 or 5% of your money per year, and I'm showing you an example where, where if you do lose this, this is almost 5% in a week. So some part of you could look at this and go, I hope I lose it. Because that means in the next week, my stock would have gone from 63.74 to 67. And even if it doesn't, someone's going to give me around 75 cents per share just for taking the risk. 
<coughs> and people say, yeah, but what happens if it goes down? Well, if we own the stock and we didn't do options at all and the stock went down, well, what would happen? We still own the stock. So this isn't a guarantee of anything. This is just a guarantee of we're going to put this money in our pocket the minute we sell that call. That money gets deposited into the account regardless of where the stock goes after that. So that's where we're having to constantly manage is where is it now? Where could I potentially lose it? In what time frame am I willing to have that contract outstanding versus what do I need? So we could also say, well, I don't know, 67 is possible because the stock just was at 72 two weeks ago. So let's go to 68. So then you can make a decision. All right, well, if I go to 68, so now I'm selling someone the right to take it from me at 68. Now they're going to pay me less, right? Because the probability, this all works off probability. The probability that it gets to 68 is less than if it gets to 67. Therefore, they're going to pay me less. Okay. Question so far. I know, like I said, I know you're not going to walk out here an expert. Just basically, is there any questions at this point? Do you have a rule of thumb on the bid ask spread? Uh, it's you. I mean, it's out of my control. It's all. I understand that, but I mean, for you to choose whether you want that, don't you want it closer than large? Uh, farther apart the bid ask spread? No, because there's nothing I can do about it. Anyway. All I care about is this number here. Do I want do I want 76 cents to lose it at 67 or do I want 55 cents to lose it at 68? Okay. That's all I'm analyzing. Okay. The rest of it is out of my control. So, so if I sell a call and I get 79 cents a share and it goes to 66, I got the 79 cents and too bad for the person that so right. bought it. Right. So the number one question is people always look at this and your question going, well, who would do that? Who's on the other side? It's important to understand that most of you have spent your entire investment life buying things and wanting them to go up. There's a whole bunch of hedge funds out there that make their living when it goes down. Because then they can just buy a bunch of it. Or... Right. So the concept of I buy at 50, I want to sell at 60 is like them selling at 60 and buying at 50. They make money every time the stock that they're holding goes down. And this is the big argument because if I worked at Pepsi and I hated my company, and this happened years ago, I could put cyanide in the Pepsi, I could short the stock, I know once the news comes out, it, the stock is gonna drop and I'm gonna make money. That's what happened in September 11th. If you go back and look at the trades of September 10th, the shorts that came in on September 10th, hotel, airlines, all the, the, the types of sectors that they knew were going to be affected by what was to happen the next day. Mm -hmm. And yet from that, our wonderful Securities and Exchange Commission has arrested nobody. Wow. And it's clearly, this happened the other day. So FedEx yeah. comes out with earnings. And, and the, the, the CEO not only had bad news, but said the forecast is bad. 10 minutes before the close of the day before it dropped 27 percent all of a sudden you see options that came in and so that person on a on a 500 million dollar or some 50 million what they put in end up with 130 million dollars of profit from those options and that's where the uncovered options can be beneficial because you don't have to put up all your money Right? If you were to own FedEx with that many options, you, you'd have millions into it. So people trade the options because you don't have to put in all of the money. You're just buying, putting in money for the, for the, uh, the premium of the option. And yet we will not hear anything about who did that. And yet it's all documented. They could figure out who did it, who's connected to it, what account it came from, what firm, the whole thing, and we'll never hear anything about it. Will they get arrested? No. Not unless they're Martha Stewart. Right? Yeah, right. Well, that's and that's that's what is interesting is that the one of the problems, which is beyond me, one of the problems in the industry, which is why the SEC kind of calmed down about going after these people, is they've had cases where they have wiretaps of people talking about this, and they go to court and they still can't win for insider trading. Wow. It's unbelievable. That's why usually if you have mergers and, and acquisitions. 
Usually mergers and acquisitions are announced on the Tuesday after a long holiday weekend because it gives both sides the ability to meet over the weekend, get the attorneys to get the agreements done, get the marketing people to put all the books together so when they go to CNBC and talk about it, it's all now documented as why they're doing all this. And obviously, the more people that know about that and are working on it, it's going to slip out. But I could go on for hours about the financial business. But the bottom line is, it's out of my control. So we just do what we can do. So, so anyway, so that's where, that's all I, I'm looking at this. But you're, you're exactly right. So in this type of situation, you say, well, who's the person giving me the 75 cents? It's those people that are shorting the stock. So they're willing to pay us a premium to take it away from us if their short strategy defaults. So it's a you know they could go in there and have ten thousand shares of a sixty four dollar stock and want to short it down to fifty five, but if it goes to seventy, they get to take it from us at sixty eight. So it's their insurance, just like we on the long side we can use protective puts which we don't have time to get into, but we can buy our own downside coverage, right? And that is a lot, a lot of times that's better. Buying protective puts is better than many of you have heard from different people on TV. When you buy a stock, put a stop loss on it. Has anybody ever heard that? It's the most idiotic news to me that there is. And why would I say that? Because if I'm willing to do all my research to buy Oxy Petroleum as an example at 70. So when I heard that Buffett was approved to buy Oxy Petroleum up to 50%, and I knew over time, is it going to go up tomorrow? I don't know. Is it going to go up next week? I don't know, but I want to get in there. But a couple of weeks ago, it was 72. So let's just say that you got in at 72 and you said, I'm only giving myself a 10% stop loss and then I'm out. So the computer knows. As soon as that stock drops 10% from where you got in, it automatically sells. So then what? I did all this research or I came across this great news and now I'm back to cash. So what? I lost 10% and now I got, I got to go back to the decision of what do I do with the cash, which is the problem of the investment industry, period. What do I invest in with this money? So what happens? You take the cash Oxy Petroleum goes back to 70. You think you missed out. You made a mistake. You get back in there. Now you have less shares than what you sold because you're buying it at higher versus where you got out. And you just keep doing that after a few times going, what am I doing here? I, if I'm going to go buy a stock and it goes down, I'm buying more stock. I'm not selling. I didn't do all this research and watch the stock to have it go down 10% and get out. I mean, we've seen the market. You guys have seen the market. You got these stocks going up 15 or 20% in a couple hours. So that, I just I just don't like that strategy. But people on TV like to talk about. It, but I don't really think it works. But you're saying in that scenario, if it goes down 10%, you would instead of selling it, buy more. Right. At that point. Right. Okay. Because the the mentality is is if I like it at 70, I should like it more, more at 66. Okay. As long as the management and as long as the news and everything yeah. is still yeah, yeah. stable. Yeah. But as long as all that. that. Yeah, yeah. But that that's what you're always analyzing. Chasing it down. That's okay. what you're always analyzing because there's a point where I'll get in at 60 and it'll be at 30. And that's why at the end of the day, investing is so difficult, which is why you need as many different strategies to exercise at given markets, given time. Right now, this covered call strategy on certain stocks is very hard, which is why usually about noon on Fridays, I figure out which are the volatile stocks like Meta, like uh, Salesforce, Twitter, NVIDIA, <laughs> stuff like that that moves like my, you know, Microsoft's case. And I look at it going, sure, I'll get 27 cents for it to go up $3 in three hours. And if it happens, then I'll close it out right before, because I don't want to lose it. Then I can buy that call back, which is well, maybe we'll have time to get that. But anyway, I'm willing to take that chance because, again, there's no cost for trades and it's in tax deferred accounts. So why not? This is all part of this, the free money. However, in volatility, it also ends up creating more issues. It'd be great if the market just went up 3% a year, down 2% a year. This is you know, four, eight, six percent in a matter of a couple of days. So it's more difficult, but that doesn't mean it's not useful. Okay. So anyway, so let's keep going. So we've we've gotten to that point. So again, the people paying us are probably trying to protect themselves. And this is where I was talking about with Microsoft. This is what happened. So if you scroll down to the next example of Microsoft, you're going to see the circle. 
that at 1241 Eastern time, which is 1141 for us, the stock was at $242.82. Okay, so again, I circle where the, the earnings date is. I look at what the dividend yield is. And just using all that information to make, make my decision. Now, a lot of times if I sell a call for that day, I look at this right here. So a lot of times on Fridays, what we've seen is the market either charges forward and then pulls back or pulls back and then it charges forward. So that's why I wait till around noon because it's a lot easier to gauge where the market's going at noon than it is at opening at 8.30 when all kinds of things can happen. So I use this at this example saying, okay, where is the peak of where Microsoft has been on that day? So it has only gotten just under $245 or $244.50, which means if I sell a 250 call, I've got to ask it to go back to where it's already been twice, which is usually it doesn't happen that way. And then I've got to ask it to go 50 cents higher from there. So I feel comfortable at that 245 mark to be able to sell a call and to lose it in three, a little over three hours. Okay. So what do I get paid to do that? So if we scroll down to the next page, we can see it's still at 242.77. The call option expires on September 16th. And we're going to go down, boom, there it is at 245. $245 a share is that we're going to potentially sell someone the right to take it away from us. And they're going to pay us around $26 a share. Or 26, 26 cents a share. Okay, so 100 shares, we got 26 bucks. So some of these examples that I'm giving you, like on Microsoft, these very high dollar, I realize it's hard for people to have 500 shares of Microsoft to make this worthwhile. But my, the, the point of what I'm showing you is, is that I could show you Roblox or Twilio, which are $60, $70 in, in Roblox case 40, and they offer the same type of volatility. So they offer that same 27 cents where people could have two or 300 shares. And even though 27, seven, 27 cents on 300 shares doesn't sound exciting, it's almost a hundred bucks. And if I do this with eight stocks, that's $800 to make in three hours worth of risk. That's the way I look at it. That's why I say free money. Now I don't need you, I can go golfing. I don't need to do this for you guys, right? But at the end of the day, it's in my best interest to do it. Because like I said, it helps you earn income. It helps pay my fees. And also why leave the money on the table? I'm, I'm hearing that you're more of a weekly buyer, right? Because you're you're talking about even three hours variety. Well, so with, with just stocks that offer this type of volatility, not Verizon, you can't do this with, because you're going to okay. see an example okay. of Verizon. The next example we have, or it's in here, is that there's no premium. So Verizon, you might have to go out four months. Uh, there, all right, you answered my question. So that's okay. where it's a portfolio, okay. right? You have yes, different yes. stocks, right. you have different risk. So that's where I go back to. For some of you that might be 67 years old, you know, like you said, in the first part of my career, men, you only had like three or four years left statistically. Now you could have 25. So you, there has to be a part of your portfolio that is still growth oriented. The difference is, is it amazes me. And I do the best I can with clients to constantly, I email them way more in down markets than up markets, right? Because I'd rather have them be mad at me that we're only up 14% instead of 17, than we're down 28%. And why didn't you see this coming type thing? So anyway, the bottom line is, is that you have to look at all of this and say, it all goes together. That's why I'm saying you can't call up the number going, I have hundred grand, what should I do? I, I don't know. What should you do? <laughs> is this your life savings? Is this your fund money? Like, what is this? And this is my point. You laugh, but it's, this is how this industry works. Nobody really cares that you guys get through retirement successfully. I'm just telling you. And the proof of that is look at gold. When gold is at an all-time high, the brokerage industry comes out with products that are gold-oriented, like they did with Bitcoin, because they know you guys are interested and see that on the news and want to be a part of the gold rush. The reality is you should probably be selling the gold when it's at an all-time high. But then when gold drops, there's no commercials anymore. That's when you're supposed to want to buy, and it's beyond me. Maybe by the time I'm out of this business in 50 years, I'll figure it out. Why? And just ask yourself this. Why in almost every aspect of your life, you're looking for discounts? You look at a car, you want to wait for it to go on sale. You look at clothing, on sale. You want an airplane ticket, on sale. You want a house, on sale. You want stocks, you run when they're on sale. <laughs> Why? I don't. You know, that's <laughs> like, yeah. 
I said, I've been doing this for 26 years. The amount of calls I get of, do you think this is a good time to buy versus, holy cow, what should I do? Should we get out? Yeah. It's unbelievable to me that people just don't get it. And I don't understand it. I truly don't. So what I tell people is there's two important parts of investing, and there always will be. We all know buy low, sell high, but we all know most people buy high and sell low. And that's why most investors hate the market, right? And if you want an example of that, and you're honest with yourself, let's say you're ready to take a flight and you go into the gift shop and you see the best mutual funds of 2021. And then you see the worst mutual yeah. funds of 2021. Which magazine are you buying? The best. Why? Because you want to get in and hope it keeps going. The smart investor says, uh-uh, I want to look at what has been beat up. And again, like you were saying, as long as there's still good management and there's good issues around it, it's just the market taking down a good company. That is what we want. So right now, back in November, I had a lot of money put in cash. I didn't care that in, the clients weren't making any money on it. Because again, people on TV talk about, you stay in cash, you're losing to inflation. Really? I'd rather lose on inflation than to put my money, my hard earned life savings into a market that money manager are buying stocks that this is don't hate. That's what they say. And you've heard them say that. Anybody that watches financial shows is, well, you know, this is an attractive sector. Well, when isn't it attractive? And the only time that they start changing their tune is when it's down so much that they are gonna lose credibility if they don't start changing their tune. The difference is for someone like me who has saw this in 2007, I was an idiot by having half the client's account in cash earning 5%, idiot for months as the market went up to new highs. And then what happened in October 17th of 2007? Bam. In less than 60 days, recession. So idiot, genius. And that's what investing is about, the future. So people that are on TV saying, I think it's time to get out of uh, NVIDIA and move it over into Clorox. Why? If you look at the price to earnings ratio, Clorox, Clorox is trading like a high tech growth company. Why would I want to be in that? There's only one place for Clorox to go and that's down. Now we could argue when NVIDIA is going to go up, but my point is, is that that's what we have to do. So what do you do? You just sit in cash, and you say, I never know. So I step one, I'm out of the market. That's good. But I got to know when to get back in. And no one calls you. And there's no, there's, there's nothing on TV that says now. Nah. So what do you do? You look at it based on your own situation. And you say, every time the market dips, I'm going to buy two shares of Microsoft. And I fully realize this, it could go down another 10 points. So what? Those two shares are down 20 bucks but it's the only way that I'm going to be able to dollar truly dollar cost average in the best companies in the world and set myself up for one, two, three years from now when I could have 50, 60, 70% returns off the best companies in the world, not high tech. I hope this works out. No, these are the best companies in the world. And that's what I'm interested in. I never know when to get in. So I have to just, leave it upon myself to slowly buy in. So in my case is that again, I go back to if a client has 30% of their account in the market, well that 30% that's in growth is not looking good, but 70% is still waiting. So the 70% of the money, it needs the market for me to be right. I need this market to keep going down because otherwise, why am I sitting in, in so much cash? And now that the federal funds rate's going up, I'm getting, I'm gonna, in the next three, four months, I'm gonna get paid 4% on that cash. So there's no rush. There's no rush to get into a market when I'm finally getting some yield on cash with taking no risk at all. So that's like the ideal scenario, market falling apart. I get to pick when I wanna get back in. I can get in very, very slowly and I'm finally getting paid to take no risk. And that is something that we've not seen for over a decade. Okay, so that part is very, very exciting. And that's why I say, if you have cash, you should want this market to drop because that's how you make money, okay? But it's retraining the brain, okay? So anyway, so let's get back to this strategy with Microsoft. So are you saying you just have a money market? You expect to make 4% on money market? Okay, there's a big difference between what the bank offers and what a brokerage. So what I'm talking about when I say cash, 
what cash is in, a, in the brokerage world is it's in the money market uh, uh, fund in a brokerage firm. It's not in your checking account or your savings account where they're giving you 1%, right? So it's going to be, when I talk about 4%, I'm saying this is where the Fed is going with, rate, with hiking rates. So we're going to be close to 4% in the next few months. If you look at treasuries, the two-year treasury is almost already there right now. But I don't want to, I'd rather get less on cash because cash is nimble. I can do what I want with it. I don't have to sell treasuries and be wrong. And, no, I just want to sit here and get nothing. And now I'm getting paid. So now it, there's less incentive to try to rush in. Okay. So, all right. So we'll go back to my Microsoft again. I think you guys can, can see. Again, even though Microsoft, $245, it's tough to have 500 shares. I get that. But the concept is what I'm talking about, is if you start monitoring this stuff, you'll just start to see around 25 or 30 cents to ask a stock to go up with three hours left of the market on a weekly basis. That's that's about what you're going to get. That's about as good as so you have some stock. They have 500 shares. It's 150 bucks. And if I have 10 stocks, that's 1500 bucks. We're doing absolutely nothing. So you said about a quarter. Uh, it's about a quarter yeah. is what okay, so generally what you're going to look for with three hours to go. So like on Friday, you just get in there and, and, and then you just sell some calls and just see what happens. Yep. Basically right. like going fishing. Yeah. So, so, yeah, right. yeah. So I've, I've come down to now is that I don't, I don't work a lot of hours on Mondays and Tuesdays because unless the market's really down, then I will go in and buy one to three shares, five shares, something like that. But there, there's no rush. There's nothing to do. I mean, I've been through this many times. So Pete, the, the personalities on TV, Right, you you've got a finance show. You got to talk all day about this stuff, and you guys watching it all day. It makes you want to do something. And the reality is, why? There's nothing to do. So again, if you have cash, you want to see. Oh my God, it's down. Like this morning, you have certain stocks that are down, and if you would have bought and say, I'm just going to buy three shares in one day, it's now you're already up three or four dollars a share because it went down two. Now it's up to it's one day. Think about what that will do in one, two, three years out with the best companies in the world. I'm not talking about high risk stuff, just the best that I can buy is what I'm looking for, okay? So that's why I'm not gonna sell calls on Tuesdays like of Oxypatron because I don't know, I can't control three, four days of news. What I do know is in a stock like that is I give myself a couple days. So on Wednesday, if it's trading at 64 and I sell the right to lose it at 69 and it, it gets called away from me in three days, so be it because I'll go around and buy it again. That's the beauty. As long as there's no taxes, there's no reason, to, in my mind, there's no reason not to do this. It just takes time. That's that's the difference. It takes time to monitor all this, but it's worth it. In my mind, it's worth it. So, okay, so let's, um, yeah, what time is it? We're gonna oh, run out of time. Um, yeah, it's like three. Uh, 3.01 and we go to 3.30. Okay, so that, that, that'll be about good. Okay, so now we look at that and say, all right, but you know, you are at a point if you know if you're older and you definitely need some yield, then you can look at good stocks like Verizon. Okay. And again, as I'll mention, less than two months ago, Verizon Verizon was 52. So what happened? They came out with their earnings. So this has happened two earnings ago, two quarters ago, it was at 52, it dropped to 44, then it got back to 51, and now it's 41. And all of that drop happened after they announced their earnings. And that's what we're going to see here coming up in the next week or two is we're going to see a whole bunch more examples of FedEx. It's going to be these CEOs are going to be going out of their way to say it's China, it's the COVID, it's it's not me, it's not my, I'm not a bad manager, it's all these other factors, and they're not 100% wrong, but they're going to set investors up for it is really, really bad out there. The market is going to reflect that. Remember, we're still five percentage points away from June lows. Okay, so very easily. There's, that's what I mean by it. there's no rush here. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to change anytime soon. Here's the interesting thing I'll tell you. When you always hear the term, don't fight the Fed, which means when the Fed is cutting rates, they're going to help the economy turn around, stock should go up. How long that takes, none of us know. But I want to put two things into perspective is that in my career, if I go back before I even started in the business, the market was coming off of 1994 pullback. In 1996 is when we started to see this hyper growth happening. 
and Greenspan was out there raising rates bound and determined to defend the wealth effect. So he was raising rates, 50 basis points quite often to get it up there. So my point is, is that they raised rates and in 1998, we got over five and a half percent on the federal funds rate. At the time I was working at Merrill Lynch and we were, we were, we were calling business owners and churches saying, you guys can put your money because churches have very strict guidelines on where to invest. You can put your money into a money market and get five and a half percent, right? That's exciting. So the point is, is that when you look at it, say, all right, well, what happened? There? We went above 5%. So I use five, not five and a half, but we were at five and a half. We went above 5% on the federal funds back in 1998. And the best way that I can tell you to understand what the federal funds rate and how it works is the brake on the train. So if I raise 25 or 50 basis points, like bumping the brake on a train going full speed, nothing is going to happen. Then I hit it again, nothing is going to happen. I'm gonna to have to keep hitting it until I start to see any resemblance of slowdown of the economy. That is what raising the federal funds rate does. Nothing is happening other than psychology of what's coming. But if we go back and look at the facts, the facts are, is that we went above 5% on the federal funds in 1998. But when did the crash of the market happen? After we went above five, it was about 18 months after we went above 5% before everything collapsed. So that gives you some idea of what could be the lag effect in all of this. So then you can say, all right, that's one piece of data. Let's go to the next piece. So we can look and say, all right, well, what happened in 2004? Same thing. When we started in bombing Afghanistan, the market started to recover in 2003. If you remember the lows from September 11th down to September or 2001 to 2003, then it started to come back. So what do they do? They started bumping up the federal funds rate a little bit, seeing that things are starting to really recover. So what ends up happening? In 2004, we get above 5%. And at the end of the day, when was October of 2007? Once again, it was about 18 months after we went above the federal funds of 5%. Now, is that gonna happen this time? No, but it's data. There's no one piece of data that tells you everything. It's just learning from data. And although this situation is different, so was the credit crisis. So was the dot-com collapse. It's always going to be different, but we've got to try to learn something from previous uh, history and, and, and how the markets react to federal funds rate. So that's why I look at federal funds rate, break on a train. Whether you're trying to increase the speed by hitting the accelerator or hitting the brake, nothing is going to happen for a while. The market, and this is, the, this is very important to understand, the reason that the market started dropping in January of 2022 is because the market is always going to act before the event of an economic downturn or upturn. So the market was already starting to price in. Things are slowing down. Stocks are overvalued, even though they hadn't even raised the federal funds rate yet. And people are wondering what's going on. Why is the market falling apart, but yet the economic data is still good? And that's what's gonna be something that you're gonna see, which is why I say, you gotta be right twice. So now what's gonna happen is the stock market is gonna start to go up, even though the economic data, the current economic data, doesn't seem like it supports the market moving up because the market is going to forward price in good times and in bad times before the economic data that's right in front of you current is gonna make any sense. And that's the problem is everybody tries to correlate the two. You have to think ahead, okay? That's where people end up saying, I got out at the right time, but then the market fully recovered and I might've actually gotten back in the market or in a stock higher than where I actually got out. And that's why I go to work every day, because that's the million dollar issue. And that's where 
I look at what Buffett was able to do to generate his uh, history of great stock picking is completely different, 100% different than throughout my entire career, which in a couple of years will be going on 30 years. It's just different issues, which is why he has more cash than he's ever had on hand because he sees the same thing I see. He sees the same thing that a lot of good portfolio managers see is there's nothing to buy. There's no excitement. And that's where the million dollar issue is. He's working with money. I'm working with people. So somewhere in there, we have to do something or these people are gonna run out of money. And sometimes we just can't help you, to be honest with you. Sometimes you come to us, you have waited way too long. The lifestyle you want is way above what you can afford. And there's, there's just truly nothing we can do, right? And that's what we're trying to avoid. So anyway, so we look at a company like Verizon and we say, all right, well, this is a good company. And the other thing is, it's also important to understand is at the end of the day, look what happened to companies that did business in Russia when Russia invaded Ukraine. Okay. So immediately you had companies say, I'm out of Russia. So McDonald's shut down, Starbucks and so on and so on. So what I've been saying for a long time, since basically February of this year, is if you look at that issue and you look at the issue that China is bringing up with Ukraine, if there actually is some type of invasion from China to uh, Taiwan, you potentially could have companies that say, well, I can't be known as a company doing business in China. So if you own Starbucks stock, you own zero growth whatsoever because all of their growth they've reported is in China. So if they come to the conclusion that we have to scale back or get out, then you've got to forecast that. And that's why I think it's very interesting, this rhetoric that's going on right now. And the fact is, is that Kamala Harris going over into Taiwan that allowed the military in China to start getting closer and nobody thinks it's weird because if they started moving the military closer and nothing had been the trigger, well, then people would start to be talking. But now it's just, they're going to sit there and they're going to sit there and now we're going to have this rhetoric. So smart companies like Apple, who recently signed a 10-year deal with China, is now starting to realize we've got to move some of our production out of China. And that's what you're starting to now see is corporate America saying, we ain't waiting around. We have to start removing our reliance, our sole reliance on China. And that, whether or not there's an issue with Taiwan, I'm not smart enough to know, but it's why I, la I talk about all the TVs and computers I have, because this is all part of what it is we need to be doing. In my opinion, nothing is gonna happen. President Xi is up for re-election. He's not gonna do anything before that. You have the Chinese New Year, which is gonna be until February 1st next year. So in my opinion, if there's something, especially if the Republicans take the House or Senate or both, is that China's gonna realize after the Chinese New Year, boom, we gotta move. Because once, once the Republicans come in and now start actually making impact is, in my opinion, they're gonna believe it's too late. So as a portfolio manager, how do we push that risk in? So when we look at a company like Verizon, we, we just forecast that in our brain. I don't know if it's gonna happen or not, but we look at it going, what is gonna be the economic reaction in the United States if that does happen? What companies, is, is Verizon got a lot of exposure over into Taiwan or China? Not that I'm aware of. So that really shouldn't be impact. Would it be impacted? Of course it is. Their stock price has gone from 52 to 41. Not because they're doing a hor you know, horrible job. It's just the whole market is dragging it down, right? So these are the types of investment choices we have to make. Uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Are they going to are they going to not be used anymore? There, are there, is that industry not going to grow because there's an issue in China uh, from China and Taiwan? No, it has to do with our own growth of electric vehicles. Now, whether you agree with it or not, the fact of the matter is they need to be charged. Yeah. And so that's what I mean by building a portfolio. And there's you just got to remain objective. And that's a problem with most investors is I'm a Republican, so I hate Biden, so I don't I, I'm not going to buy anything of, of what he's doing. Or I love Trump, and then I you know. You can't do that. You can have your, but when you're an investor, you're an investor, right? And you're trying to take the benefits. Don't, do I like a lot of what Biden does? No, but I look at what he is done. Now, I can't control and say, all right, well, it is what it is. Now, how can we possibly make money from it? 
which is why I always laugh because as Democrats, they hate the oil industry, but there's nothing better than, for oil stocks than when a Democrat president takes office. Actually, the worst thing is for a, a stock owner of a, a oil company is when a Republican president comes in because what they do is they increase the, the uh, pumping, which then increases the supply, which then drives down stock. So it's actually the exact opposite effect of what the Democrats think they're doing. They're the ones making, which is why every time there's a Democratic president, the oil companies make money hand over fist. And the next thing you know, you start talking about an excise profit tax and round and round and round. And round. So that used to be the big issue that we manage. Now, obviously, the world is we got a lot more issues to manage. So anyway, so we go back to Verizon saying, look, I need a four or five percent return. I'd like to do it as conservative as possible. And so I'm going to go back to the earnings day. OK, it, it's coming up. So that may impact whether or not I want to get in or how much I, I want to buy. And then we look at it going, what's my yield? The, the annual yield right now, based on this current stock price, is 6.32%, which is pretty good, right? So it's great, but I don't want to just buy stock because it pays good yield. If I took that mentality when the stock was 50, when Verizon was 50, and the, and the yield was 5.2%, well, that's great. I'm on par to make 5.2% for the year, and I'm down 20% on my investment. Doesn't make any sense, right? But you hear that all the time, buy high dividend paying stocks. Well, it's like Clorox. If Clorox is a high dividend paying stocks and you get in at the wrong time, two years from now, you could enjoy another 40% decline. There's no easy answer. That's what I'm saying is that the, 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 the media outlets, they're, they're just shows, right? They got to say something. They're on the air all day. But the difference is you don't have to listen to them. I don't listen to them. That's why I'd rather go play golf because there's nothing good that comes from listening to these people. Uh, so anyway, so that's what we're going to look at. So we're going to move on. And uh, so again, if you see this was as of 1225. Um, James, I do have a right. comment on, you know, what you're talking about, the dates and stuff. And yes. That's happened to me on the ex-dividend date. Right. I was going to get that. I'd sold a covered call and I was going to get it. And they, they went ahead and purchased it because it was it, it had, it was above the strike price and they got the dividend. So they can buy it before <coughs> expiration. Right. Very rarely does that happen. Yeah, but it happens. Very rarely. <laughs> but that's why I factored in. Yeah, right. Well, and trying to keep from losing the dividend, you just want to I lost the dividend because of it. Right. You don't qualify because you're not in it at that moment. Because they exercise it prior to. Yeah. See, this is where it goes. The reason I say that rarely happens is because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, again, the vast majority of these people that are paying us, they're short. So th they don't want this stock. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why usually the computer is the one on, on Saturday mornings. You log in and you see whether or not it was taken. Sometimes if it's only like four or six cents over and you should lose it, you don't lose it. Yeah. Okay. I have a question from someone online. Sell an option on your own stock, then the ex dividend date. Who gets the dividend option holder or stockholder? That may have been what you Yeah, it's along the same line. Right? It, it, it all, can explain. Right. Yeah. It all depends on what day is what day that was the last day for you to qualify for the dividend, whether or not you're going to get paid or they're going to get paid. Okay. Right. So at the end of the day, that's why I factored in. Is it that big of a deal? Generally not. The biggest deal in this strategy has to do with, is this money in a taxable account or is it in a tax deferred account? That is going to change everything. So what a lot of times I find is that people own index funds in, in tax deferred accounts because that's my retirement account. And then they do all this aggressive stuff or, or own a lot of mutual funds that have high turnover, which creates capital gain distributions. So actually, if you're going to implement this type of strategy and you have taxable account and tax deferred account is you want to reverse it. You want to own the index fund in your taxable account and you want to use this type of strategy in your tax deferred account. It's all for your retirement. So I get, this is all the time from people is that, well, this is my retirement. It's all your retirement money. So that's why we have to build the portfolios and use the strategies that are best for you, depending on your situation and what type of accounts you have. Okay, so, so anyway, so we look at the, so then again, I looked at Verizon, so we're just going to follow the theme of, I, I just wanted to see what you could get one day. So at this, at this time, I was willing to lose Verizon at 41.50, which was only 30 cents, right? So the reality is, is I'm not going to mess around with that. So that was a no-go, not interested. And that's just another reason of a stock that's not volatile is not going to pay that well, especially short term. So don't really even look at it. 
would you say is now a good time to be buying two shares? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you look at a stock like Verizon, again, you take into consideration if there's an invasion in Taiwan and all of that, where's our economy going? You ask yourself. Now, I know Verizon's involved in other things, but just ask yourself in general, what would it take for you or what do you think the public, it would take for the public to shut off their AT&T, T-Mobile, or uh, Verizon cellular bill? What would it take? Nuclear. Probably a nuclear, <laughs> right? It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Well, the nuclear could happen, but it's not going to happen if people should. This is one of the last things they ever shut off. They stopped drinking Budweiser, that, uh, Budweiser before this. But it, is it possible? It's possible, right? There's a reason it's gone from 52 to 41, even though people are still paying their bills. Because again, the other thing to realize with index funds is if, if my job is to mirror the index, when money comes in, I have to buy all the stocks that are in, say, the S&P 500 index, which is why it lifts all bulls. The reverse is what's going on right now is now that the index funds have grown so much that when people say I need to get out of my index, the manager has to generate that cash and they sell everything across the board because it all works in proportion with each other. And that's why the more money you have, you do not wanna have mutual funds because what will happen is even though you're a long-term investor, if that mutual fund goes down and a bunch of people are asking for redemptions, that manager has to go in and sell to create the money to give to the people. And then those same people, when the market goes up, then they come back in with that money. And now I got to go in and buy stuff that's 10 to 15% higher than when I got out. And you're a long-term investor and you're the loser of all that. That's why years ago, the people that had around 100,000, and now it doesn't need to be that much, started to say, you know what? I'm not messing with mutual funds. I don't mess with mutual funds at all. And one of the reasons is, is because I don't want to have broad exposure to all the market across the board. But number two is, is that clients that work for a living, they have 401ks and those 401ks are in mutual funds. So they don't need to come to me and hire me to go buy them more mutual funds, which is why at the end of the day, why is the financial industry charging 1% to take your money and put it into a mutual fund? And the mutual fund has two to 3% of its own fees, which means you are losing 3% in fees. It doesn't make any sense. And here's another interesting thought, is that if you look at the S&P 500 last year, it was up 27%. So in that regard, the broad-based investment strategy of being diversified worked for you. If you took out the top 15 stocks of the S&P, your return was closer to 85%. Whoa. And this is what's happened throughout my career. It had, the same thing happened in the dot-com days is that we started to look at the S&P 500. And even though it did good, people started to say, wait a minute, if you take out at that time, it was 20. If you take out the top 20 stocks of the S&P and just put your money into those, right? Still pretty diversified because there is 20. Then you look at the returns, which were astronomical versus what the index was. So you started to see the Janus 20, the Alliance 20 is that then the mutual fund companies caught on to this and started to come out with these mutual funds that had the number 20 in it because now the argument is you can be too diversified so if i own the s p 500 why in the world would i go out and buy more funds how diversified do you want to be right so that's why in up markets everybody looks smart everybody that picks their own funds looks like a genius it's in down markets where people start to say, holy cow, I guess the person I'm working with doesn't know what they're doing. I thought my mutual fund manager would have kept me out of harm's way. And that's what I'm telling you, they can't. If I'm a small cap manager, I can't take money out and go buy large cap stocks. That's not allowed. It's in the bylaws of the fund, which means if you want to get into large cap stocks, you can't think I can do it because I can't. You need to do it. So whether you're your own advisor or whether you're working with somebody, you've got to get them to understand at the end of the day, there's, there, we can't sit around anymore. I do agree that if you have 10, 15 years, you can buy the index fund and just don't mess with it. I think you should because there's, there are times where you should increase your exposure, decrease your exposure, get out. But at the end of the day, this, this buy a stock and hold it forever is it's just not working. We're not in that climate anymore. 
I look at uh, Wayfair stock, for example. Started buying it in 2016 at 39. I think it got as high as 368 Whoa. seven years later. And where's it right now? 44. So if I'm a long time investor, <laughs> I'm up five points. <laughs> but at one time, yeah. I was up you know, several hundred percent. So anyway, my point is there's no, there's no one answer. The, all of this stuff has to continuously be monitored. So that's why we're doing this today is because we want to have different strategies for different markets, different times for different needs. So then we can look in, so last Friday, then I look and say, all right, well, let's go to Verizon. Let's go one week out. So Verizon's 41.19. What happens if I'm willing to lose it at 42? Someone's willing to pay me 18 cents. Well, as it showed you just on, on Friday, it, it was up 16 cents or ha almost half a percent. So at that time, it's like, it could happen. It could get to 42 and I really don't want to lose it. So it's not worth it. But what if it goes to 43.50? Well, now it's only, it's only paying me two cents. So it's not worth doing that whatsoever. So I just leave that one. All right, so then we're going to go to November 18th. So now we're going to go out a few months and see how things change. So now we can look at it saying the stock is 41.19. I'm going to sell someone the right to lose it. I'm going to sell them to take it from me at 45. And now they're going to pay me 30 cents. So you, you remember in the Microsoft case, we were asking it to go up a little more than $2 in three hours was paying me 27 cents. Here, we're asking this thing to go up almost 10% by November. And they're paying us about that same money, which is why I say both strategies you need to be you know, open and diversified to do different things. So, 30 cents, that's still not a bad deal for Verizon. I mean, for God's sake, if you were in it at 50, you might be frustrated. But if you're going to buy something at 41 that's that's paying you that kind of dividend yield and you're going to lose it at above 10%, even if it's a few months out, it's still a pretty good deal, right? It's, it's still something you got to consider. The premium's not great, but the fact of the matter is it's, quote, free money because I'm still qualifying for the dividend as long as I hang in there, okay? But if that doesn't do it for you, then we'll just continue to move on. So now this is where you really have to pay attention because for some of you uh, that have sizable investment accounts, this can be substantial to understand this. If a stock is 4120 and it's a high quality, good dividend paying stock, and I can sell someone the right to take it from me at 45, they're going to pay me 67 cents a share. If they, if they, going to take it from me at 46, they're paying me 48 cents a share. So that's 1%, right? This one and a half percent. So the stock goes from 41.20 to 45. And on top of that, I get almost one and a half percent in quote free money. If I ask it to go to 46, now it needs to go up almost 15% to be taken away. And who in the world wouldn't want that over a few months? And someone's willing to pay me 1%. So on top of the 15% that I almost take here, I get another percent here. And within six months, I'm at 16% off Verizon. Plus I still make the dividend along the way. Now, here's what's really gonna have you amazed. When it comes to taxes, if this is in a taxable account, the way the IRS looks at this is the IRS says this transaction didn't happen until the exercise date, which is January 20th of 2023. I get the money today. It's not taxable money. It's taxable after January 20th of 2023, which means it's not income until 2023, which means I can pay tax on it in April of 2024, and if I file an extension, October of 2024. So the more money that you have in your investment account, you can use this strategy to say, you know what? Uh, I need to raise money for the new boat. I need to put my kid through college. I'm even gonna pay for your new braces. Whatever it is, you're getting all that. And if you did this with multiples, you could generate 40, 50 grand, and you're not even taxed on it, until 2023, which means you have another year to use that 50 grand. So where this becomes popular is in down markets when you want to use your portfolio to generate income so you have more money to put into dollar cost average into markets that are way down like they are now. So that 50,000 is going to be able to maybe 
by the time you're actually taxed on it, the 50 became 80. You see how powerful this is? And this is what I mean, you look at this goal. I don't know. I listened to some guy talk about selling cover calls and now you're looking at it going, holy cow, how did I not know about this before? Well, I worked in the industry for two years. The only reason I knew of options is because it was on the series seven test, but it was never implemented in client's account. It's just, you had to know that it existed for the test, which is funny because a lot of the series seven exam is on options. And yet the industry, 85%, 90% of the advisor, they don't even use it. But yet it's a big piece of the, the series seven test. Makes no sense, right? So is this the right thing for you? I don't know, but this, this, is, this is what I'm getting back to. This can be extremely important. Now, is it is it that critical if you only have 100 shares and you, you're gonna be that excited about $48? No, but the point is, what if you have 5,000 shares? Now you're starting to say, or you have a portfolio, right? Because this is just one. You could do this with multiple. And that's where at the end of the day is that you're starting to go, wow, all of this strategy together between the selling with three hours to go, the going out six months into the next year, like, wow, this is all starting to add up. So when I need my 5% five, five return, or I need my $20,000 of income from my portfolio, this is why this strategy comes in because it starts to help. And we don't, ideally, we can use options. We don't even care if this thing goes up. I just don't want it to fall apart because no strategy works when the markets are pulling good stocks down like Verizon from 52 to 41. There's nothing you can do. The only thing you can do is to get into protective puts, which I'm not gonna, we don't have time to go into and it's way beyond what you guys really need to know because I know you're not gonna go home and do protective puts, but it, there is a way that you can buy protection like a term insurance policy. And I will get, you know, unless you guys have more questions, I do wanna give you an example of how on a large scale this really works. And how I got into this strategy and realizing its importance is, is back when a lot of the clients that I was working with made millions and millions of dollars from stock options. And so a lot of times is that the stock options were granted, you have to pay tax on them. And if you don't sell them, which happened to a lot of people, they can go down in value and the IRS still wants their money. So you have to figure out a way to protect those clients. So what do you do? Same thing Mark Cuban did. So we'll bring it home to here to Texas. So Mark Cuban is you know, stubborn as he is, was smart enough to know not only when to sell his company, but he was also smart enough to take the advice of Goldman Sachs, which did a strategy called a collar. So what a collar was is we look at Yahoo stock, which is what Mark got when it, at the time it was around $150 a share. So at the time is that you, you're a billionaire, but it's possible that if you don't protect that, you can become less than a billionaire. So what he did is that he went into the options market, which is normally where this strategy comes from. It comes from high, high concentrated positions with executives that have their whole net worth tied up into their company stock. That's where this strategy starts. All I'm doing is taking this strategy and implementing it for you guys because anybody can do it, but it makes more sense from them because it's their, usually it's their whole net worth, okay? So in his case, he says, look, I've got Yahoo stock at 150, which at the time was quite a rise. So he started to get into selling covered calls, 155, 160, 165, to give himself some upside on some of the shares, because who doesn't want to give themselves upside? So when you sell those shares and you're selling the right for people to take away from you, you receive money, which is what we've talked about. Now, in order to fund the insurance, the quote protective put that I want to buy, that I'm going to buy 150, 145, 140, because if, if the stock's 150 and I buy 130 of coverage, that premium is cheaper than if I want to sell it right when, or I want to buy the protection right when it's at the current price. So what he did is what's called a zero cost caller. You take the stock where it is, you sell some upside, you generate the revenue and then you buy the protection on the downside. It's not a stop loss, it's true protection. So if you buy it for six months and you bought the right not to lose it under 150, when the stock goes to 100, you don't care because you know within your time, in your contract, you can 
exercise that put option and you're out. You're out at the price of which you bought the coverage at. And that's essentially what he did. Now, if we look back at how useful that strategy was, it wasn't many years later. I'm talking only a handful of years later after he sold the Yahoo, his company, and took the Yahoo stock, the Yahoo dropped down to 17 bucks a share. Oh. And that's why I say it's usually for high concentrated positions because even though I'm a billionaire at 150, I'm not a billionaire at $17. And it's just another example of buy a good company and hold it forever nonsense. It, I just, and it's very interesting because I like to stay factual because there's a lot of people that have opinions, you know, I'm not really interested in people's opinion. It's facts. And the facts are, is go back in history and look at the top 10 companies in the 90s. In the 90s. And then from 2000 to 2010. I'm talking in the world. And see how many of those names have changed. Which who, means... Who would ever thought GE and Exxon out of the uh, right. Dow Jones? AOL. Yeah. I could, could go down the list. So if you're a, a buy, I hold it, I love it, and you... That's what I mean. Your opinion doesn't matter when it comes to investing. We try to stick to the facts. And the facts are, it just doesn't seem to work anymore where buying and thinking you own the same time. You could have bought Chevron thinking that Chevron is great and then look at where we are now at the attack of that industry. Do I still want to own it? I want to own it at times, but I don't want to think that I'm just going to hold on to this thing for years. And that's where I mean that we're starting to change. And that's where, unfortunately for me, because I hate politics, both sides bother me. But the, the bottom line is, is it is integrated. Try watching Fox Business. It's 80% about politics and 20% about business. And that's the way the markets are. And that's what's so frustrating. You cannot get away from it. Worst part of the job is having to keep up with all that stuff. And I really learned that back in the Greenspan days. I used to watch on C-SPAN because it would help me sleep at night. They would rerun uh, when he was talking to the Congress. And what would happen is I started to realize that the Republicans, they get five minutes. And the Republicans were asking questions. But basically, they were talking for about four minutes and 50 seconds of that. Yeah. And there was no real time to respond, which means they never really cared about a response. They just needed to get their question on record. And then the Democrat would step in and they would do the same thing. First, they would attack each other and then they would just continue to make a statement and no real information would come from it. And I kept hearing this from both sides going, this is unbelievable. This isn't even right. You have the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve in front of you and you still cannot come up with questions and actually let them answer. How did that help you sleep? It's just because Greenspan's voice, yeah. it was so soothing. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll stay with you. You're yeah, listening to them. Well, I was beyond the aggravation because I just, I know how it works. And so the difference to me is, is that, you know, because my dad used to listen to Rush Limbaugh and I'm like, dad, right. you're just wasting your time. My brother listen, listens to Bannon and, and I'm looking at it going, guys, yeah. just wake up. You watch Tucker Carlson, you know, and, and Hannity and all them. They, they're making 50, 60 million dollars a year to keep you aggravated so you can tune in every night and be upset while they're cashing in a million dollars a week. And at the end of the day, what are they promoting to do change? They're promoting the problem, but where is it that they're actually promoting what steps to take to create the change? And to me, it's like, that's where I fall off both sides. I actually grew up as a kid liking CNN because CNN back in the day was news. It was news, you know, real news and objective news. And now obviously they got way off in the left, but their new president is bringing them back. And right now, I can tell you, I hear as many stories about the, the Biden administration coming from CNN as I do now from Fox. So hopefully, we've got more news stations that are going to give us data, because that's all I care about. <laughs> it's just unfortunate we have to follow. But you guys don't. You can pay somebody to follow, but it's why I have so many like computers and, and TV, because yeah. it's, it's essential. You have to do it. There's, there's no other way. And the day that I don't want to do it is the day that I retire. It's just, it's that important. So uh, just in a recap, I know this is very, very confusing. Hopefully, like, you know, in, in any 90 minutes is that you've just heard a couple of things that will help you uh, go through the um, options book that, that you're going to have access to. All the information's there. I know it's going to be even more confusing. That's why I try to back, you know, better, you know, for a lack of a better word, dumb it down so real people can 
understand this stuff and see if it's it's for you. And if you think it is, then you have enough knowledge now to either learn more on Google, say, look, I, I want to implement this. And then you're going to have to go down the, the path of finding somebody that will be able to do this for you. Could you do it on your own? You could do the Verizon on your own. You could say, I want to, I want to go out a few months. That, that's not rocket science. You have uh, to spend a lot of time on it. It's, it's a lot of times unless you're willing to go four or five months out. I just don't because at the end of the day, the risk in Verizon is, let's just say that I own it at 41 and I sell the right to lose it at 45. And then um, Facebook comes in and buys them at $69 a share and I'm out. Like that's where we get called out, which is why I don't normally like to go that far. I'm just trying to get free money. That's how, all it is. How far? How far are you talking? You don't like to go how I don't far? mean, I, in my example here, I, I wouldn't even like to go to November. So you're because number, number one. We stayed at Friday. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> ideally, I try to stick to weekly, but on right, certain okay. stocks, at least monthly. Okay, so all right, month, all right, monthly, all right. Monthly, and then I yeah, don't even, yeah. I don't even go the full month. I wait until a couple weeks into that month. So in this case, is I have to look at Verizon and say, as great of a company it is, there's a reason that it's down from 52 to 41. Mm -hmm. And the company itself, yeah, they're not doing great things, but they're not doing 20% worth of damage. So the odds that this market starts to turn and we get a, a, a ramp up in the market, this thing could be at 45 or 46 in no time, and I don't really want to get out. Yeah. That's the problem with going that far. It's great when you sell it, but the reality is, is that this stuff can move quick. And that's why it's so difficult right now, even with boring companies, because I, I can look at Medtronic. I can look at Budweiser. I can look at Baxter. They're all down 20 plus percent and they're great companies. Mm -hmm because it goes back to what I said about indexes. When people are pulling money out, the managers have no choice but to start selling, which then brings down everything. So they go up together and they go down together. That's really what we see. Great. Thank so you. anyway, I wanna thank you guys. Uh, I guess if you wanna e email more questions, and email sure. them to you, you can pass them yep, on to me. I'm happy definitely. to help individually. Uh, uh, but other than that, I want to thank you guys very much. Well, and hopefully if, if this goes well, your comments are good. We can, you know, we can come back and do this again, because this is something that hopefully you're going to start to go back, do a little research, go, you know what, I'd like to learn more because I, I really think that's something I could implement. Yeah. So how will we get the book? Um, so you've emailed it I, to us. Yeah, I emailed it to Tina, so she has the PDF so file. If she hasn't already emailed it out, I'll do that when I get back to the office. There was an okay. email she sent this morning. Oh, okay. Yeah, it could and be. It you guys already, have already been gone. Yeah, it may have already hit. Because I sent it to her Friday, and okay. depending on when she got into the office and stuff. And, um, so oh, wait, let me see. It's just jamesligan.com. Oh, just thank you. W-I-G-E-N. Yeah. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. The best part of the job right here. Educate.